in place of our usual live informants, we're doing a, a video informants this year. And so this video is going to show you a lot of the things that we would have shown you in our live informants. In a typical year, we would have all met together in the cafeteria. The kids would have been in their nice little rows with their instruments. They would have plucked for you. They would have shown you some of their bow exercises we've been working on in class. And myself and Mr. Salazar would have talked extensively about all the different things that we use in class, the different um, products that, you're, that you've bought for your kids and things we use with your kids to help them learn how to play their instruments. Um, obviously, we weren't able to do that this year, so instead we've put together this video. Um, in it, you're going to see little little videos of things we've done in class, how we teach the class, and then we're also going to have little snippets to show you what to look for at home when your kids are practicing. Um, things about their position and posture, uh, good left hand shape, good tone, what that all looks and sounds like. Um, learning a string instrument is kind of a tough thing to do, and for our virtual students, um, we've been trying to keep them engaged as much as possible and uh, w and work with them as much as we can through this little system we have here. But um, generally speaking, I've been pleased with what I've been seeing, and I hope you're pleased with what you're seeing at home. Um, but anyway, this video is going to sort of just serve as our informants, because an informants really is an informal performance and more of an information session for the parents, so you can kind of have an idea of what your kids are going to be doing this year, how they're going to learn, and how we teach, and all that good stuff. So without further ado, here is how we run our class. Four E's. Ready? cycle everybody huh? open string cycle I we'll put the open strings with this on on your D string and set. And release. On your A string, set. Make sure your wrist is bending towards your face. Make sure that your fingers are overlapping and touching the frog. I mean, you're kind of up like this. Get your fingers down low. Part of it is your thumb sticking through. Go ahead and And what you're going to look for, release, what you're looking for is your bow hairs being parallel to your bridge. Remember, parallel is two lines that never intersect. If you're, if you're pointing like this, your wrist is straight and you're going to bow into your head. If you're like this, you're going to bow into something else. Parallel lines. Good. Touch your G at the frog. Yes. And release. Violin G, viola C for the fingerboard. And I make sure that I'm really moving my bow light. I'm not pushing in. Using a light. 
So I'm going to talk to you about left hand position on a violin and a viola. Um, I'm holding a violin right now, but the technique is identical between the two instruments. It is very important that your child's wrist is straight when they play. And we're in what's called guitar position right now. We will eventually transition to on the shoulder, but for right now we're sticking with guitar position because they need to produce a good clear ringing tone. So when they play, it should sound like this. Now, if they're sounding a little bit funky like this, they're not sinking their fingers into the string enough. So they have to really push in. And it's very important that their fingertips are pointing down into the string. Notice that my fingernails are really short. Acrylic tips do not work for violin and viola. So girls, you can have any color you want, but just no acrylic tips. And notice that I'm making a box shape with my fingers and my big first knuckle at the base of my hand right here, this is the knuckle that I'm touching to the side of the neck here. My thumb is pointing straight out. I'm not pushing it behind me. And there's a small space between my hand and the neck of the instrument. I know it's hard to get on video there, but the important thing to remember is that they're not choking it and their thumb should not be up really high either. We have to make sure that we keep it kind of low, but pointing those fingers the tips into the string is super mega important. And we also make sure that we hover our fingers. This allows kids to play fast. If they don't hover, if they do something like this, it slows them down and they won't be able to play quickly and they won't be very successful. They won't like how they sound. So guitar position, we're looking for an angle of about 45 degrees. Some of the kids are trying to hold it like this and we're nagging them to get it up like this. So when you're seeing it at home, making sure that they're sitting up straight in their chair, feet flat on the floor with their wrists straight, sinking in those fingers. This is what we're listening for. And that's all we have for this. All right, parents, uh, today I want to review how to set up the left hand successfully onto the cello. So we're going to start by having a C shape with our left hand. So we got that natural C shape going on here. It's like we're holding a can of soda. And on the back of your child's cello, there should be a heart sticker right here between the first and second stripe. If not, your thumb is going to go directly in between the two stripes. So also uh, something to keep in mind is when we get ready to put our fingers down, the hand, the palm of my hand does not come in contact with the neck of the cello. The only points of contact are the thumb and the tips of my fingers. Something to keep in mind. Okay, so for now, my thumb is right here holding up the neck. My wrist is nice and straight. I'm not bending the wrist at all like this or like this. Mm -hmm. You want to make sure, I always tell the kids, if I took a Hot Wheels car, it should just roll straight down your arm with no issues at all. So make sure that your child's wrist is nice and straight. Make sure that their arm doesn't rest on the side of the cello um, because eventually when we start playing faster notes and uh, we need them to have a lot more dexterity with their left hand, circulation gets cut off and then eventually when we need to start shifting, uh, this is going to get in the way. So it's best to just make good habits now and to make sure that their elbow and their arm does not touch the side of the cello. Now, when it comes to adding fingers, we are going to make sure that we're not pinching with our hand, okay? We're not crabs, we don't do that. So instead, what we're gonna do is we're gonna activate this bicep and we're gonna pull in the string to the fingerboard. Um, so let me demonstrate what bad tone sounds like. So if your child sounds like this when they play, that means they're not pushing, or not pushing, but they're not pulling hard enough 
the string into the fingerboard. So we're gonna activate this bicep muscle. We're gonna make sure the string comes in contact, uh, not just with uh, one finger, but with all the fingers down. And if your child does it right, their tone's gonna sound like this. So notice how the, the note is ringing after you play it instead of a thunk sound like this. If you hear thunks, your child needs to reevaluate the amount of weight they're putting into the string. All right, guys, and that's all we need to know right now for cello. All right, guys, today I want to tell you how to successfully set up your left hand on the bass. So the first thing we want to do is we want to make that C shape with our left hand like we're holding a can of soda. And when I place my thumb on the bass, it's going to go on the back of the neck. There's not a sticker here, but on your bass, there should be one. Uh, it, your finger, your thumb is going to go on that sticker. If your sticker fell off, uh, the easy way to remember is it goes halfway between the first tape and the second tape located on the neck of the bass. So my sticker, I'm sorry, my thumb goes right here. My fingers, they hover above the fingerboard. My hand does not come in contact with the bass. So if your child is, ends up doing this when they play, that's a no-no, okay? There should be no contact with our hand at all on the bass. The only points of contact are the tips of my fingers. All right, now, uh, when we're setting up our left hand, we wanna make sure that our wrist is nice and straight. We're not bending the wrist this way. We're not bending the wrist this way. We want it uh, flat and smooth. If I took a Hot Wheels car, it should just roll down my arm, no problems. You also wanna make sure that the elbow doesn't touch right here on the base as well. If this happens, it means your child's being a little bit lazy and they're, they're getting a little too comfortable. So you're gonna to need to let, make sure that they, their elbow does not touch the base because eventually when we start playing faster stuff and we need to shift, if, if they're like this, that doesn't look right and it's not comfortable and it's just better if we just keep it like this. Um, when we place fingers down, we want to make sure that uh, the fingers come in contact with the string and we're making contact with the string onto the fingerboard. My first finger goes on the first tape, my second finger goes halfway in between the two tapes, and then my third and fourth, well actually my third finger just kind of la lands right there, and my fourth finger, my pinky, lands on that second tape. When I'm pulling on the, the string, I'm not pinching, okay? Make sure your child's not pinching. I know it's easier said than done because it's hard to tell, um, but you wanna make sure that they're activating their bicep muscle when they pull back on the string. Um, also, another thing, if you can tell by the shape of my hand, I kind of mentioned it earlier, but you have space between the first finger and the second finger. I call this finger pattern the I love you, I love you, I love you, I hate you finger pattern. We don't really hate our first finger, but we really wanna emphasize the space between first finger and second finger. And that's all we need to know for now for playing the bass. So good tone, what does that sound like and what should they listen for at home? Thank you for bringing that up. So if uh, your child's practicing at home and you hear this, that thud, that thunking sound, that's not quite the sound we're looking for. That means they're not pulling back hard enough uh, with their biceps. So remember, that string needs to come in contact with the fingerboard. If that doesn't happen, you're gonna keep getting that thunking sound. If they do it correctly, you'll get a more clear tone and it's gonna sound a lot better. All right, guys, thank you. Now we're gonna talk about using the bow. We've just started doing a few bow exercises in class. They've been using a pencil, they've been using a straw, and now we're graduating up to using the actual bow. And so here are some things to watch for at home. First things first is that for violins and violas, they have to bend their thumb into the horsehair. So there is a small space, and you can see where, where my thumb tip is. This is where their thumb needs to go. There's a space between their thumb leather and the frog is this little spot right here and the edge of their thumb, so I can show you from right there, this edge right here is gonna touch right there and I'm actually pushing my, my thumb into the hair. So we tell the kids and we threaten them, don't touch your bow hair and everything. Well, there's one spot you can because if you're holding your bow correctly, this part will never touch the string so you're fine. So one of the exercises we do in class, we hold it with our left hand, we shake out our hand, we do thumbs up, thumbs down. Look what happens to my elbow here. My elbow goes up, wiggle my fingers, bend my thumb, 
I place my thumb, index finger, middle finger, third finger, pinky on top. Now, notice that my knuckle is lined up with this part with the stick right here. Some kids try to do this. This is not going to work. You have to have it here. I personally gravitate just a little bit past my knuckle, but that's just me because my hands are smaller. For some of my students who have longer fingers, they really need to be lined up with this knuckle right here. Middle finger is usually touching around on the ferrule on the frog, but again, it just depends on their finger lengths. Avoid this. A lot of kids try to do this. This is not good. This will slow them down. A lot of kids do this. Yeah, my thumb is sticking out. We can't have that. Your thumb tip needs to be bent. A lot of kids do this, where, where their thumb is straight. Now, this isn't as obvious when you are first learning to use the bow, but here's what happens. When you go to put your bow on the string, if your thumb is straight, what that does is it makes it makes your bow harder to control and this is a this is not a good playing angle and it prevents them from moving their wrist they have to bend their thumb which allows them to spread the bow hairs out and produce a good clear tone so we're teaching them in class how to do how to do all that we haven't actually pulled the bow across the strings yet but the most important thing you can watch for at home is making sure that their knuckle is lined up with their winding and that their thumb is bent. The in-person kids will be taking their bows home soon. Virtual kids already have them at home because they have to have their bow for this, even though I'm terrified that they're developing bad habits. I've made them all promise me not to use their bows unless we tell them to. But this is what you're looking for for violin and viola bow hold, like this. Here's all angles around. So there's below, here's from the top, and all that good stuff. All right, today I want to talk about the bow hold for both cello and bass. So even though I am holding a cello bow, the same thing applies for upright bass. So when it comes to holding the bow, we always want to start by, with our left hand, we're going to grab the stick of the bow. That way with our right hand, we can get properly set up. So the first thing we want to do is give a thumbs up, thumbs down. Remember, by doing the thumbs down, it naturally raises the elbow, which is something we might need uh, in a little bit. And then we're gonna bend the thumb. If you look right here on the bow between the thumb leather and the frog, this space, this gap right here on the stick is where my thumb is gonna go. So usually I like to tell kids uh, to put right past the fingernail, this part of my thumb makes contact with the stick. So we're gonna add that here. And then we're going to, once we get this here, we're gonna pretend like we're dumping out a flat can of soda. Um, I, I, I like soda, it's, it's a good drink, but yeah, this one, not so much. So we're gonna dump out that can of soda with my other three fingers. Um, they're going to naturally just kind of rest onto the stick. That way, when I come in contact with the string, they naturally go right here. Now, after teaching cello and bass for quite some time, uh, usually the, the bow hold is not, like getting it initially is not the issue, but it comes to when we start playing and kids get tired, they usually do a couple of bad habits. So the one I see a lot is my pinky will start to slide this way and then my, the, the palm of my hand ends up making contact with the bow and then your hand ends up looking like this. This is not right, I call this the point, right? Because if I take the bow away, it looks like I'm pointing at something. So we don't wanna have that happen. If that happens, we wanna make sure that the pinky goes naturally back over here and that this part of my hand never touches the bow. Another thing I wanna point out is my first knuckle right here. I'm sorry, not my first knuckle, my first finger. My second knuckle naturally rests, for me on this bow, it naturally rests on the winding of the bow but it's gonna go right there. I also want you to notice that uh, my, my wrist is also kind of naturally pronated. I'm kind of turning in my wrist this way. It's not necessarily flat like this all the time uh, because when we start uh, moving the bow on the strings, uh, by turning the wrist, we get a better, more fluid motion with the bow and we overall get a better sound as opposed to this. Um, also, you wanna avoid uh, holding it by the the tips of my fingers. So if you look, um, if you hold it just by the tips, your child's gonna lose your bow or lose that bow as soon as we start playing. So a good point is actually the second knuckle right here is a good contact spot for pretty much all the fingers, really. Um, 
And, but you don't want to go on the third one because that's too much and you might risk touching the bow hair. Um, and then, yeah, bad things happen. And last but not least, let's talk about that thumb. So sometimes when uh, I see beginners play, usually they'll start off right, and as we get going, their thumb tends to naturally get stiff, and this is what we call the banana thumb, because if you look, your thumb kind of looks like a banana when it's super stiff. So we don't want a banana thumb, we want what I call a texting thumb, which all your kids should probably know. Uh, but that thumbnail, once again, uh, and the, the skin right past the thumbnail, that touches the stick, the other fingers on the second knuckle. We're, we're pronating our wrist, and that is our cello bow hold and bass bow hold. So I'm going to talk to you about shoulder rest for a little bit. This is mostly a violin viola issue, obviously, because cellos and basses don't put their instruments on their shoulder. And if they do, that's don't do that. That's not a good idea. So your shoulder rest is designed to keep the body of the instrument off of your shoulder, give you a little extra height here for your neck, and most of all, keep this clamp off of your collarbone because if your collarbone is getting that piece of metal, that's not very comfortable and kids aren't gonna like that. Your shoulder rest is intended to help you hold your instrument flat like a table and the kids should not have to hold, uh, hold up their instrument with their hand. They should be able to do this without any other assistance, okay? So they're using the weight of their head to lock in this little curve into their collarbone here, okay? So their face should be going straight in front of them with their the scroll of their instrument at about a 45 degree angle. So this particular kind of shoulder rest I'm using is called a coon. Um, this is the kind that I personally used and I've used it for years and years and years. What your students have is a kind of shoulder rest called an Everest. This is what everybody's beginner kit came with from Dallas Strings. These are great as well. These are a little more economical. I think these are like roughly $12 at Dallas Strings, whereas this, something like this is closer to 20 or it's seen some better days. I had to glue, glue it back together. But anyway, the... The legs are extendable on these, which I really, really like. And I personally need a little bit longer of a leg here. So there are longer legs you can buy for these. Um, they're about six, six, between six and eight dollars. We actually have them here at the school. So when I'm evaluating your kids, if I see that someone needs the taller shoulder rest leg, I'll let you know. You just send in a few bucks and we can take care of that for you. So the coon. Is a, is a really good one, like I said. Um, Everest is another type, and 95% of my students are gonna use this perfectly fine. Um, but there are many other kinds of shoulder rests out there as well. Um, this particular type is called a resonance. It's very flexible and bendy and all that kind of stuff, and you can make it you can make it adjust to the size to fit the violin really well and all that. Um, they come in different heights. These are these are okay, um, but I like the fact that these other ones you can adjust the the height as needed. This one is it's fixed. You really can't. Um, nothing wrong with this. This in fact this is what I first learned on back in the day, um, and then I learned about coon and kind of haven't gone back from there. Um, there's another type of shoulder rest out there that has a similar concept that has a curve, but it's more, it's a little more, a little less pronounced here. You can also adjust the angle of the legs as well, which is kind of cool. So some kids might need this. Um, what we don't normally do is if I notice that a kid's really struggling with their shoulder rest, we have all these here at the school. We'll just pull them aside and try them all out and see and see how it works. Um, this is another really popular Wolf brand um, shoulder rest, which this one ha this one has a little wire you can adjust and you can screw these legs down and unscrew them up and everything to adjust. This is actually a little bit taller than a coon. So if I have a kid with a really long neck, then we could put them on something like this as well. This this is a little bit more expensive. I want to say this is around thirty dollars. Uh, but again, um, these are it, the cost is all relative to making sure the child is comfortable when they play. Um, I personally play for can play for hours with my shoulder rest and I don't really have 
any neck pain or whatever. You don't want a shoulder rest that's too low because that makes the kid have to lower their neck to their, lower their head and it puts strain on the back of your neck and that's not good for you. It really hurts your shoulders and the kid's in a lot of pain and nobody wants to play for that long, for extended periods of time. So again, Coon is really good. Everest, perfectly fine. There is one other kind out there. So I've got some kids that, that have like really, really long necks or like they're still growing and so their proportions are a little odd. And that's where we bring in the Bon Musica. Now this is not cheap. This is a $50 shoulder rest. And there's lots of like little parts and adjustments you can make and little screws that fall off in the middle of a concert. Not that I know from experience. It totally happens. But there are kids who need, but this is also super, super bendy. You can bend this to fit the kid however you need to. So this, there are some kids out there who might need this. So again, if I feel like, after working with your, your child that they really need this, then um, I'll get in touch with you and let you know. But for the vast majority of the students, your Everest that you got from Dallas Strings is perfectly fine. Nothing wrong with it. I will tell you, viola parents, um, with their most of them are on a 13 or 14-inch 14, 14 viola. When you eventually get to a 15-inch viola, you will need a larger shoulder rest because the one that came with your kit, actually for, for all the violas, um, they got one that looks like this. This is a violin for four to three four size. So your my viola students are all already using this as it is. But when you go with to a 15 inch viola or it even goes larger, um, that's when you're talking about needing a new shoulder rest. And they make one specifically for viola that's for the larger frame violas. When I'm talking about inches and in violas, I'm referring to this is a violin, but I can use it for an example. It's the measurement from the base of the body here to the heel right here. And so the larger the viola is, the proportions grow as well. So the the, the, the lower bouts here are larger, um, the upper bout is larger as well, the neck is longer. Um, it does, it is a much larger instrument. So um, right now I don't have any beginners who need to be in that large of an instrument. I mean, some, some of your kids are real itty bitty and they're on, some of them are even on like a 12 inch, which is perfectly fine. Keep, keep feeding them their, uh, their Wheaties and all that and they'll grow and eventually they'll need a bigger instrument. But um, for the violins, a lot of you are on a three-quarter size. Some of you are on a half. Um, if you're on an instrument that's not the right size for you, don't go to Dallas Strings until I talk to you first, okay? I'll let you know what size they need. Um, you might need a new shoulder rest depending on what you get. If your child's currently on a half size shoulder rest, they should be able to go up to a three-quarter size violin. And if, if I'm sorry, if they're on a half size violin, and they need a three-quarter size violin, that same shoulder rest will work. But if they're going from a half and you know they have a gigantic growth spurt and they go from a half to a full size, they're going to need, need a bigger shoulder rest. So again, um, these are all things that I can discuss with you individually, but the vast majority of my students are fine with this. Some might need this, and if your child is particularly um, strange, for whatever reason, uh, they might need one of these as well. But I, I find that very infrequent. Most of them are able to make do with this. So that is my little talk about shoulder rests. The only thing that I can mention about shoulder rests is that they should generally fit across the body of the instrument, across the back of the instrument. I always tell the kids that the, that the shoulder rest should smile at them. Okay, So they're holding it upside down, they're smiling, et cetera, et cetera, which is all fine and good. Um, Sometimes we do have to adjust the angle slightly. So if a kid is really getting that clamp, most of your kids' clamps are right here. But if that clamp's really digging into their shoulder, um, we can adjust that shoulder rest so it's a little bit more of an off-center smile where we have more support down here closer to where that clamp is. But like I said, the vast majority, I'm seeing a lot of really good stuff. And so I haven't seen the need to email any parents to let you know you need a different shoulder rest. But... If something should come up and you have any questions, be sure to let us know. All right, today I want to talk to you guys about stuff that cello and basses are going to need. So as a cello and bass player, on the bottom of our instruments are end pins, and we use the end pins to kind of raise the height of our cellos and basses to meet our needs. Also on the end of an end pin, um, there might be a rubber stopper that keeps the end pin and, or the cello and bass from sliding around. But sometimes that's not always present or sometimes that rubber stopper alone just doesn't cut it. So there are 
there are a couple of accessories that you can pick for cello and basses, and I want to talk about those today. So the two accessories that you can get, uh, either one's fine. You have the Zeros uh, in pin anchor, or you have what's called a rock stop. Both of these things keep the cello and bass from sliding around, and they also protect your floors as well. I want to talk about the rock stop first. Uh, so this is, uh, it looks like a hockey puck. That's what I call it at least. And it's got this kind of material on the bottom that kind of keeps it from slipping if it's on a either a tile floor, essentially anything that's not carpet. Uh, this is going to keep it from slipping around. Um, sometimes this might uh, wear out because it might get kind of dirty on the bottom. So if you clean it off, uh, it, it, it won't slip as much. Um, but these are a lot more easy to uh, kind of set up. All you got to do is put on the ground and you're good to go. But sometimes these can lose their, uh, their stickiness in terms of like slipping around. So take it for what you will. I like these. They're okay. Uh, but I also want to talk about the other accessory, which like I said earlier, is the Zeros end pin anchor. So this end pin anchor serves the same purpose. You've got this little slot in the hole uh, where your end pin goes. So cello bass players will just kind of line up their end pin to match right here. Now there, this is different because on the bottom uh, we have this doohickey and this goes actually on the, uh, if you play cello, it would go under the left leg of your cello chair and it's got an adjustable strap so you can adjust it for whatever height you need. For bases, uh, if you use a stool, this would go underneath one of the feet of your stool and you would do the same thing. So both accessories are great. Both of them keep your cellos and bases from slipping around. Um, yeah, so make sure you have one of these, even if you have carpet at home and you don't need to worry about, uh, you know, using one of these because your carpet kind of does the job. If you ever go, <clears throat> excuse me, if you ever go somewhere that doesn't have carpet, then you're definitely going to need to get one of these to be, you know, ready to go for any circumstances.